Genesis chapter 42. Hope everyone got a chance to enjoy our record-breaking temperature today. Broke a record that was set in 1899. It's supposed to be 70 degrees tomorrow for a high. <laughs> so, <clears throat> strange weather. Before we get started, uh, would you bow with me for a word of prayer? Almighty Father in heaven, we bow before your majesty, thanking you for this day, thanking you for the warm weather, thanking you for the recent rains, thanking you for the material blessings that we have in this life, all the physical blessings that we enjoy. We pray for our, your church around the world that struggles in difficult places. We pray that you will be with them and bless them. Pray, dear God, that you will be with our number who are physically sick, they are going through difficulty in their life physically, that you will bless them, help us to serve them in whatever way we can. We pray, dear God, that you, you will be with those who have gone astray, and we pray that they'll repent and come back before it's too late. Those who are in the process of falling away, Lord, we pray that we can do or say whatever It is that's necessary to get them to realize their spiritual neglect. We thank you so much for the Bible, for the examples that we have in the Old Testament. Help us to learn from the life of Joseph and help us to make application to our lives. We repent and we ask for forgiveness and we thank you for your mercy and grace. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before we get into uh, Genesis chapter 42, let's look at 41, kind of back up a little bit, and see how that, of course, Joseph is now uh, exalted to basically the right hand of Pharaoh, so to speak, being second in command of all of the nation of Egypt, the most powerful empire on the face of the earth at that time in, uh, in human history. And, of course, Pharaoh had a dream, and Joseph was the only one that could interpret the dream. He says in verse 29 of Genesis chapter 41, Behold, seven years of great abundance are coming in all the land of Egypt, and after them seven years of famine. So he's letting them know that the the images that Pharaoh saw in his dream represented seven years of abundance. It's going to be a seven-year cycle of of good abundance, the the crops are going to do well. And then after that, there's going to be about a seven-year cycle of severe famine that's going to reach all the way throughout the world and, and affect uh, Joseph's family back home uh, in the land of Canaan. And we'll look at that when we get into chapter 42. His name is changed uh, or given an additional name in verse 45 of Zephaneth Paneah. That is the Egyptian name for Joseph. Oftentimes when uh, someone would come into a, a, a region or be uh, brought into a culture, they would be given uh, the name that is familiar to the people of that region. And so he is given that name. You look at verse 50 of Genesis chapter 41. It says, Now before the year of famine came, two sons were born to Joseph whom Asneth, the daughter of Potipharah, priest of On, bore to him. This is the the woman that he married. And as we pointed out before, Potipharah is the priest of Ra, R-A, the uh, one of the main deities of Egypt. Verse 51, Joseph named the first Manasseh, for he said, God has made me forget all my trouble and all my father's household. So in verse 51, you have the first one named uh, Manasseh, and that means making to forget. That's what his name literally means. In verse 52, he named the second Ephraim, for he said, God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. And Ephraim means fruitfulness. Fruitfulness. 
Now, as he is naming these children, you can see why he is naming them these names. Uh, as you see, he's saying in verse 51, God has made me forget all my trouble and all my father's household. Does that mean that he has, his memory is totally wiped and he just doesn't know about everything that happened before? No, it means that he has recovered, so to speak, from the tragedy of what happened in his past. As we're going to see in chapter 42, he's going to be well aware of, of who his brothers are when they come to Egypt. So it's, it's helping to heal the wounds, Others, in other words. Having a child like this is helping to heal those wounds. And of course, Ephraim uh, it means uh, fruitful, fruitfulness, and showing that he is prospering there in the land of Egypt, not only by having children, but by, by uh, being second in command of all of the nation of Egypt. Verse 53, when the seven years of plenty which had been in the land of Egypt came to an end, 54, the seven years of famine began to come just as Joseph had said, then there was a famine in all the lands, but in all the land of Egypt there was bread. Bread there representing there was food there available. There was food there in Egypt because of what they did as far as preparing themselves. During that seven years of plenty, they stored up and were ready for the uh, seven years of famine. So they had a project that Joseph said to Pharaoh, you need to have this project and you need to put someone over it to oversee this project that knows what they're doing, has wisdom, and can uh, have plenty of food when this uh, seven-year cycle of famine comes. And Pharaoh says, you're the man that's the best for the job. Notice how that um, Joseph was not seeking to be exalted, but he was exalted. He was there just simply doing the, the will of the Lord, interpreting the dream for the Pharaoh, which was God's will, and as a result of that, he was exalted to the uh, uh, second in command of all of Egypt. Verse 55, so when all the land of Egypt was fam famished, and the people cried out to Pharaoh for bread, Pharaoh said to all the Egyptians, go to Joseph, whatever he says to you, you shall do. So they were prepared for this, Joseph was in charge of this project, verse 56, when the famine was spread over all the face of the earth, then Joseph opened all the storehouses, those storehouses that were built to store all the grain and such, <clears throat> and sold to the Egyptians, and, and the famine was severe in the land of Egypt. Verse 57, the people of all the earth came to Egypt to buy grain from Joseph because the famine was severe in all the earth. So this was a a worldwide, to a certain extent, um, phenomenon. So people knew where to go. So it had to be spread by word of mouth that there is an abundance there in Egypt. Of course, Egypt would have been recognized as, as a uh, powerful empire at that time. And of course, by word of mouth, they didn't have the modern means of communication that we do today. And so by word of mouth, it spread that there is an abundance in Egypt. They prepared for the worst. Look at chapter 42 and verse 1. Now Jacob saw that there was grain in Egypt. And Jacob said to his sons, Why are you stare, uh, staring at one another? It's interesting, almost humorous. Humorous statement to him. Why are you staring at one another? He said, I, there, uh, there is grain in Egypt. And that word saw there means he, he knew about it. He could see from the reports and see uh, probably from caravans and things of that nature that these people who are coming back from Egypt, they're getting a, an abundance of supplies. So uh, Jacob said, what, what are you standing around staring at one another for? Verse uh, 2, he said, Behold, I have heard that there is grain in Egypt, go down there and buy some for us from that place so that we may live and not die. So that shows the severity of their situation, that um, the famine was severe in the land of Canaan uh, to the point that um, Jacob would say, you need to go down there and get some supplies for us because if not, we're going to die. Verse 3, then 
Ten brothers of Joseph went down to buy grain from Egypt. But Jacob did not send Joseph's brother Benjamin with his brothers, for he said, I am afraid that harm may befall him. What relation is Benjamin to Joseph? It's his uh, brother that's the closest to him, of the same mother. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, Jacob is concerned about his well-being. And so he's not going to let Benjamin go uh, down uh, to Egypt. Um, he doesn't want anything to happen to him. Uh, verse 5, So the sons of Israel came to buy grain among those who were coming, for the famine was in the land of Canaan also. So they make it, of course, they would have a caravan. They would go down, make that a long journey down into Egypt. Verse 6, now Joseph was ruler over the land. He was the one who sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brother came and bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. That's a fulfillment of the prophecy that was made to Joseph some 20, at least 20 years prior to this. Remember the dreams of the, uh, the stalks of uh, wheat, the bundles of wheat bowing down to Joseph's bundle. And uh, the sun, moon, and stars bowing down uh, in the dream, the two dreams that he had. And so here they have the fulfillment of it. Now, uh, Joseph being ruler over the land, as we've pointed out before, he had to go through some difficulty to get to that position. He had to be, uh, by these brothers, put in harm's way, put in danger, so that he could be sold into slavery, taken down into Egypt, and then by God's providence and through God's revelation of the dreams and such, and him being able to interpret those dreams, rise to the power that he is now. It's interesting how God turned the whole situation around. His brothers put Joseph in danger. And by doing that, set the stage so that when they're in danger, they can survive. Now, did you think, do you think that their brothers, his brothers knew that they were setting the stage for their own survival when they threw Joseph down in that pit? No. Do you think Joseph knew about that? He knew about the dreams that he had, but he didn't have any details concerning how it was going to be fulfilled. So this is God's providence working out, turning things around for the good of God's people in spite of the, the wicked things that God's own people are doing to one another. So here you see God's providence is at work. Joseph at this time is between 37 to 39 years of age. He was 17 when he was sold into slavery. Look at verse 7. When Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them, but he disguised himself to them and spoke to them harshly. And he said to them, where have you come from? And they said, from the land of Canaan to buy food. Verse 8, but Joseph had recognized his brothers, although they did not recognize him. But why do you think they didn't recognize him besides the fact he disguised himself to them? Would he have looked like a, a sheep herder? He would have looked like a high official in Egypt. He would have looked like uh, something close to what the Pharaoh himself would have looked like. He, he would have been decked out in, in royal garb. Uh, most likely, uh, he, he would not have had, you know, uh, as according to what you see as far as the Egyptian uh, hieroglyphics, most of them, the men shaved their heads, according to those hieroglyphics that you see. So he may have had his head shaven. He might have had some sort of, uh, garment on or a something to cover his head. It says he disguised himself. But also, this is some 20 years from the last time they saw him. 
I mean, he was 17 years old when they threw him down in the pit and they pulled him out to sell him into slavery. Now he's about 37 to 39 years old. Have you gone through some changes since you were 17 years old? <laughs> some are shaking their head no. I'm going to do a sermon on lying here pretty soon. I know I have, I guarantee you. You know, when I, I just turned 34, and when I was 17 years old, I was about as thin as Mark Odom, had a full head of hair. Uh, you go through some changes in your life. So he would have looked different. He would have looked different. He would have looked like your typical Egyptian, and he was older. Went through those changes, so to speak, when you... When you get older. And so now Joseph, he recognized them. Uh, but uh, he has grown up into a, a man now. And they did not recognize him for various reasons. Uh, verse 8, but Joseph had recognized his brothers, although they did not recognize him. Verse 9, Joseph remembered the dreams which he had about them and said to them, you are spies. And you have come to look at the undefended parts of our land. He remembered those dreams, those revelations that were given to him some uh, 20 years prior. And as I pointed out before, sometimes these revelations that were given to the old patriarchs didn't happen day after day after day. There were decades spans of time between one revelation and another. And they couldn't just pull out their Bible or a scroll and just look it up. I mean, there was nothing in written form at this time. The the writing of the law did not happen until Moses started writing it. And that's why we have Genesis recorded for us. So they had to have a tremendous amount of faith based upon uh, tidbits of information given to them in Revelation here and there. And we are so fortunate to have... Everything God wants us to know from Genesis to Revelation in one volume. So he remembered those dreams. And so he's given them basically a hard time. He's putting them to the test. Once One writer says he's testing their sincerity. He says, you're spies. You've come to see our undefended parts of the land. Verse 10. And they said to him, no, my Lord, but your servants have come to buy food. We are all the sons of one man. We are honest men. Hypocrisy. We are honest men. Your servants are not spies. They were not honest about what happened to Joseph when they told their father Jacob. Verse 12. Yet he said to them, No, but you have come to look at the undefended parts of our land. He's insisting. You're spies. You're here to see where our defenses are weak. And you're here to spy us out. Verse 13, but they said, your servants are twelve brothers in all, the son of one man in the land of Canaan. And behold, the youngest is with our father today, and one is no longer alive. How ironic that they would say that to Joseph. The ones who uh, have, you know, that put him in this position years ago, uh, sold him into slavery, Wanted to kill him at first, but was talked out of it. But now he's, he's in a position where their lives are in his hands. The tables have turned, and God has turned those tables. Verse 14, Joseph said to them, It is as, as I said to you, you are spies, but this you, you will be tested. By this you will be tested, verse 15. By the life of Pharaoh, you shall not go from this place unless your youngest brother comes here. So he's he's taken an oath by the life of Pharaoh, saying that in verse 15. Verse 16, send one of you that he may get your brother while you remain confined, that your words may be tested whether there is truth in them. But if not, by the life of Pharaoh, surely you are spies. So he's insisting on them that they are spies, and he says, you have to confirm what you're saying. You go get that youngest brother. Verse 17, so he put all of them in prison for three days. It's, it's 
it's ironic here that now he has the power to to really put them to death. I mean, he could have, with just the spoken word, say, slaughter all of these because uh, they're spies. But you're going to see, as we go on, the tenderness of Joseph and how he is uh, compassionate. Verse 18, Now Joseph said to them on the third day, Do this and live, for I fear God. Interesting. He says, I fear God, singular. Joseph was in Egypt, but Egypt was not in Joseph. He was in a land full of multiple gods. He did not say, I fear Ra. He did not say, I I fear one of the other deities. He says, I fear God, singular. And so you see the integrity of Joseph, even though he's a high official, even though he has this great power and he's been bestowed uh, all of this authority by a pagan nation that believed in many gods, he still maintained his integrity of belief in the one true God. And that reminds me of you know what you read in the book of Daniel with, with Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, especially in Daniel chapter 3. When Nebuchadnezzar built that image and said, when you hear the instrumental music, you fall down and you worship it. And the three Hebrew young men said, no, we're not. And no, they didn't. They were in Babylon, but Babylon was not in them. And that's a thing, uh, a great lesson to learn there. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. And we, we may work around people and be in uh, uh, rubbing elbows with people of the world who don't care about spiritual things, but we can maintain our spiritual integrity if we, we really want to. Here Joseph is, I uh, do this and live, for I fear God, verse 19. If you are honest men, let one of your brothers be confined in your prison. But as for the rest of you, go carry grain for your famine to your households. So he's going to keep one back and said, the rest of you go and you carry grain back to your households. Verse 20, and bring your youngest brother to me so your words may be verified and you will not die. And they did so. <clears throat> Verse 21. Then they said to one another, Truly we are guilty concerning our brother because we saw the disaster of his soul, or excuse me, the distress of his soul, when he pleaded with us, yet we would not listen. Therefore, this distress has come upon us. Now, they don't recognize Joseph at this point, but their guilt is eating them up. They don't know that this Zephaneth Panea is Joseph. They think he's just another uh, Egyptian uh, that's in charge of this uh, project here, that's a high official in Egypt. But the guilt that they had was still gnawing at them, and they're saying, we're, we're, in, we're reaping what we sow, in essence. You know, Galatians 6 and verse 7 talks about that, reaping What you sow. And sometimes it may take years for that crop to grow. But it will grow. If we we sow to the flesh, we will of the flesh reap corruption. But if we sow to the Spirit, we will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. So in verse 21 it says, "We We are guilty concerning our brother. And of course they're talking about Joseph. We saw the distress of his soul when we pleaded, when he pleaded with us, yet we would not listen. Therefore, this distress has come upon us. Verse 22, Reuben answered and said, uh, answered them saying, did I not tell you do not sin against the boy and you would not listen? Now comes the reckoning for his blood. What did Reuben want to do? What did he talk the brothers out of doing? Killing him. He talked the brothers out of killing him. That's what he's saying here. Do not sin against Joseph. That's what he's referring to. But you would not listen. Now comes the reckoning of his blood because they still believe he's dead or he's he's no longer alive because they certainly don't recognize him at this point. Verse 23. They did not know, however, that Joseph understood for there was an interpreter between them. They did not know that Joseph was 
Joseph, and they did not know that he could still understand what they were saying because there was an interpreter between them. Verse 24, he turned away from them and wept. There's Joseph showing his compassion. He turned away and wept. But when he returned to them and spoke to them, he took Simeon from them and bound him before their eyes. He took Simeon, this is Jacob's second son, uh, he imprisoned him instead of the firstborn, Reuben, perhaps because he was uh, uh, the latter, because the latter had saved Joseph's life years earlier, talking about uh, Reuben having uh, talked them out of killing him uh, years earlier. So he bound them in front of their in front of their eyes to to show the point that he means business. That he means business about keeping him. Verse twenty five. Then Joseph gave orders to fill their bags with grain and to restore every man's money in his sack and to give them provisions for the journey. And thus it was done for them. So they went to go pay. They paid for for the grain to fill the sacks. And Joseph said to those who were doing it, "You put the money back in the sack." You put the money that they paid this for this grain, you place it back in the sack. Verse 26, so they loaded their donkeys with their grain and departed from there. And one of them opened the sack to give his donkey fodder at the lodging place. He saw his money and behold, it was in the mouth of the sack. So they had stopped at a lodging place, you know, going through this caravan or going with this caravan. They would stop every once in a while to rest the animals. They opened the sack to give some of it to the the donkey to eat. And lo and behold, there's the money that they used to pay for the grain. It was in the mouth of the sack. Verse 28. Then he said to his brothers, My money has been returned, and behold, it is even in my sack. And their hearts sank, and they turned trembling to one another, saying, What is this that God has done to us? Why were they trembling? What was, what was the big deal? They should have, shouldn't they have been glad that, hey, we got our grain, and plus we got the money back. We were reimbursed 100%. They were afraid of what would happen to Simeon. Retribution. They're going to be accused of being thieves. Not only being spies, but they're afraid they're going to be accused of being thieves. And so now they're trembling. Twenty years before, it was Joseph trembling in a pit. See, God turns things around. He turns things around. He exalts those who have been humbled, and He humbles those who have been exalted. We'll talk about that in our devotional time. So they're concerned about this situation because... uh, They did not know, of course, that that was Joseph. And they did not know that this money was put back in their sack. So they're saying, what is this that God has done for or done to us? So they're saying God has placed us in this situation where we're going to be in trouble. Well, really, they put themselves in that situation, but God used it for a greater good. If they had not sinned against Joseph in betraying him and putting him into the pit and then selling him into slavery, which was wrong, they could not be saved from this famine. God turned that tragedy and that sin into salvation. Does that not foreshadow something in the New Testament with Jesus Christ? The sins that were committed against him and his abuse and his trials and in his crucifixion, Brought about salvation for everyone. Look at verse 29. Any questions or comments up to this point before we go any further? Look at verse 29. When they came to their father Jacob in the land of Canaan, they told him all that had happened to them, saying, The man, the Lord of the land, talking about Joseph, they don't know who he is, spoke harshly with us and took us for spies of the country. Verse 31, But we said to him, We are honest men. We are not spies. 
We are twelve brothers, sons of our father. One is no longer alive, and the youngest is with our father today in the land of Canaan. Verse 33. The man, the Lord of the land, said to us, By this I will know that you are honest men. Leave one of your brothers with me and take grain for the famine of your households and go. So you leave one behind. You go take the the, the um, food provisions, the grain for the famine to your households. Verse 34, but bring your youngest brother to me that I may know that you are not spies but honest men. I will give your brother to you and you may trade in the land. So he was holding back one brother so he would make sure they would return. So they'd make sure that they would return. And plus, if you want to trade some more with us here in Egypt, you bring back uh, that youngest. Uh, verse 35, now it came about as they were emptying their sacks that, behold, every man's bundle of money was in the sack. And when they and their father saw their bundles of money, they were dismayed. So it wasn't just one of the brothers. It was all of the brothers and all the money had been reimbursed. And they could not for the life of them figure out why is, why. Under normal circumstances, that doesn't happen. But, of course, this is Joseph showing kindness to his enemies. He's loving his enemies. And providing for them not only the, the grain that they need for, their, for the, uh, their provisions, but also the money that they paid for those sacks of grain. So they're puzzled by this. Verse 36, their, their father Jacob said to them, You have bereaved me of my children. Joseph is no more. Simeon is no more. And you would take Benjamin. All of these things are against me. Joseph is no more. And, and Simeon is no more. So he probably believes that Simeon is good as dead. He still believes Joseph is dead. He said, You're going to take Benjamin now? All these things are against me. Verse 37, then... Reuben spoke to his father saying, You may put your two sons to death if I do not bring him back to you. Or my two sons, rather. If I do not bring him back to you, put him in my care and I will return him to you. So Reuben is saying, If, 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 if I don't bring him back, I'll, I'll take care of him. And if I don't fulfill this obligation, you can put my two sons to death. So he's saying, I'm going, to, I'm going to do everything it takes to protect him as we take him back to Egypt. Verse 38, but J Jacob said, my son shall not go down with you, for his brother is dead, and he alone is left. If harm should befall him on the journey you're taking, you're taking then you will bring my gray hair down to Sheol, or the grave, in sorrow. So he is basically uh, telling him, uh, my son shall not go down with you because if he is dead, then you're, you're, you're taking my gray hair down in sorrow to Sheol. Because they were the sons of his favorite wife. And he was concerned about keeping at least one of them alive, even though Joseph, he believed, is gone. He believed he, he is dead, still is under that impression. Any question or comment about what we've looked at here in chapter 42? We see, we see the incredible restraint that Joseph must have had. And his love and compassion he had to those who did him wrong. Because he could have, he had the power, he had the ability to, to really just to wipe them out, to really make them suffer as they made him suffer, and to really do them wrong, but instead he did them, he blessed them, and, and is, he's making uh, uh, provisions for the whole family to come down into Egypt. And that will set the stage for the family in Egypt to grow into a nation. And that will bring us into the the book of Exodus, where we find them being mistreated by the Egyptians at that time. We'll get a little bit into chapter 43, and then we'll end class. Now, the famine was severe in the land. 
So it came about, when they had finished eating the grain which they had brought from Egypt, that their father said to them, Go back, buy us a little food. So they used up all the provision. It was severe in the land. He said, You're going to have to go back to Egypt and buy some more. Verse 3, Judah spoke to him, however, saying, The man solemnly warned us, You shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. If you send our brother with us, we will go down and buy food. We've got to bring him with us. Verse 5. But if you do not send him, we will not go down. For the man said to us, you will not see my face unless your brother is with you. So that's the deal. He's got to go with us or we're not going to get an audience with this Lord over Egypt. Verse 6. Then Israel said, and of course that's Jacob. Why did you treat me so badly by telling the man whether you still had another brother? But they said, the man questioned particularly about us and our relatives, saying, is your father still alive? Have you another brother? So we answered his questions. Could we possibly know that he would say, bring your brother down? So, of course, Joseph, knowing his family, he wanted to know, is my father still alive? So he asked them when he was in their presence, uh, is your father still alive? Talking about Jacob. So he knew what to ask them. He knew what to ask them because he knew who they were even though they did not recognize him. <clears throat> Verse 8. Judah said to his father Israel, send the lad with me and we will uh, rise and go that we may live and not die. We as well as you and the little ones. I myself will be, uh, will be surety for him. You may hold me responsible for him. If I do not bring him back to you and set uh, him before you, then I will bear the blame before you forever. For if I had not delayed, surely by now we would have returned twice. Verse 11, Then their father said to them, If it must be so, then do this. Take some of the best products of the land in your bags. Carry them down to the man as a present, uh, a little balm, a little honey, Aramaic gum, and myrrh, pistachio nuts, and almonds. Why would you do that? It's a nice gesture, right? It's a nice gesture to bring. When you would go before a, a, a ruling entity, a person who is in power, you would bring something as a gift from your background, from your culture. And so it's something that you, you gather these things up and he says you do it as a present. Verse 11, and you take, uh, he says, um, some of the best products of the land in your bags. Take this to him as a present. And so that's just something that you do when you would approach a monarch if you're coming from a, uh, a foreign land. He says, Take double the money in your hand and take back in your hand the money that was returned in the mouth of your sacks. Perhaps it was a mistake. So you take double and then you take what was in the mouth of the sack. We want to make sure that this is cleared up. And you make sure that the money is paid back and then some. Take your brother also and arise and return to the man. And may God Almighty grant you compassion in the sight of the man, so that he will release to you your other brother and Benjamin. And as for me, if I am bereaved of my children, I am bereaved. And it's interesting that he uses there in verse 14, God Almighty, which is the Hebrew El Shaddai, which is first used in Genesis 17 and verse 1, as uh, it is revealed to Abraham. El Shaddai. Almighty God. So Jacob is saying, take him. And he says, this is for the survival of our people. I'm willing to let you take him. And he says, and as for me, if I am bereaved of my children, I am bereaved. If, if this has to happen and this sacrifice takes place, then let it be. But we have to do this for our people to survive. And he says, my, may Almighty God protect you or grant you compassion in the sight of the man. So that is showing that he is wanting God's protection in this situation. But all of this is happening so the nation would be protected. 
So the family of Israel would have protection. And it would not have taken place uh, if if Joseph would not have gone through the difficulty that he went through, through the misgivings of his own brethren. So that rejection of Joseph brought about salvation for Israel. Does that not sound familiar in the New Testament? In the book of Romans, talking about the rejection of Christ brought about salvation for Israel? They rejected the Messiah, Jesus Christ, crucified him, killed him. That's exactly what Peter said in Acts chapter 2. You killed your Messiah, but through him you can be saved. This is foreshadowing. Foreshadowing the great truths that we find in, in the New Testament. We'll stop our study here and we'll take it up next week, Lord willing.